I realized like I have to make a change because I don't know if I want to be the one calling all the time. I don't know if I want to deal with if it's to be, it's up to me mentality. I'm going to go out there and I've got to be the one calling. I've got to be the one doing the thing. And yeah. that was tough. And so I started pivoting, you know, several years ago. I'm going to go in on the, the online thing. But at the time, I really didn't understand. I didn't understand like the power of it. I knew that it was a real thing, but I wasn't really like I'm all in. I wasn't really optimizing. I didn't understand. And I just didn't take the time I should to do that because I was wearing too many hats in my business. I was doing too many things. I wasn't managing my time well. Hey friends, welcome back to the Evergreen Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Brady Winder with Carrot.com, and this podcast is all about helping you generate more leads so you can close more deals, build a business of freedom and impact. Uh, today, I have a longtime friend of Carrot on the podcast, Mr. Bo Hollis, and we're going to talk about what he's learned from closing over a thousand deals, over a thousand transactions over the course of nine years and having years with a hundred deals in a year. He's had some ups and downs. He's had some wild moments and we're going to go through his journey, break it all down for you. Because like we were talking about on the podcast, everyone shares the success stories and their wins, but uh, we want to talk about the struggles too and how he's pivoted and really how he's sustaining uh, his business in a wildly shifting, unpredictable market. So I don't want to spoil any more, but let's dive in. Welcome to the podcast, Bo. Man, thank you uh, so much for having me on. I really, I really appreciate it. I love this podcast. I really do. Thanks, man. Absolutely. We've been going for a while, man. I think we're like about 600, probably just before, just over 600 episodes now, which is crazy. That is. Um, I want to throw you a curveball before we get into your background and, and dive into your story. You've got a great story. Um, what's the most unique or controversial thing about your business model, about what you do differently from other investors? Uh, I would say that my, uh, I, I would, that's a good question. I would say that that answer would be that it's real popular in the space to build some big team and, you know, rah, rah brand kind of stuff and, you know, big time and pound your chest and like boiler room call center stuff yeah. and, you know, big time me, me, me. Uh, everybody knows my name and I'm going to, you know, be heard and be seen. Yeah. Uh, but that you could do a lot of deals and no one has a clue who you are and live a good life. and uh, be a, try to be a good dad and a husband and that you can do yeah. fun stuff and still not have to, uh, do all those things that are very popular. A different culture. You're laying low. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice, man. So let's, let's get into it. Let's get into your backstory. Um, just a kind of a little bit of a preview for you guys listening or watching. We're going to talk a little bit about that, the team. Uh, Bo is not quite solo, but he structures his quote unquote team pretty differently. Um, we're going to talk about what he's done when he wasn't getting leads versus when he was getting leads, um, how, why he goes, what he's doing with Carrot, how he spends his time thinking strategically about his business now versus like in year one. Mm -hmm. It's very different. There's a lot of things we're going to unpack, um, but really it's about pivoting with these little pivots over the years, you know, when things aren't going well, that's what I want to dive into. So, um, give us your backstory, man. How'd you, how'd you even get into real estate in the first place? Oh my gosh. A great story. Um, you know, uh, let's go back, you know, 10 years or so. Um, it seemed like I was a lifelong college student and I was just, I had gotten married. I was completely broke. I just, you know, you go to school and you do the things and I was, it seemed like I was going to school forever. I was just doing the thing and I was, that's what everybody, that's what you're told to do, right? You're just told to go to school, get an education, do the thing that everybody else is doing, you know? So I did that. And I, and I was going to school forever and then I had a, we had a son and then I realized when we had our, our first child that um, I was like, oh my gosh, like I, I need to make some money. There was yeah. like a, this instant thing inside of my life that I was like, oh my God. Uh, so I graduated college and ended up selling life insurance. Hmm. That was my very first kind of job, my sales job. And I never sold anything before in the world. I was a barista kind of before that. Um, at Starbucks, I worked at Starbucks for 
years, which maybe prepped me for craziness. Um, all the <laughs> 15 equal drinks I made, you know? So, yeah. so anyway, I, I did that for a while. Then I, when I got into insurance, it was my first sales job. I, I, I was kind of an academic kind of guy, thinker. I, I really loved, you know, what I was doing in school and learning. And then I kind of got into insurance and I thought people who'd sold things were kind of dropouts. Honestly, I thought I was like, mm. Oh my God. And this is not only just selling things. I had to go door to door. It was door to door insurance sales. And that took me down a road of learning how to sell. Luckily, I had a good mentor in that business and took me under their wing and showed me how to, to do the thing and did that for a while. And then my second son came along and he had major health problems. Hmm. And in the middle of that 20 week ultrasound, in my, my, my wife was pregnant and we had a 20 week ultrasound when you kind of find out you're, uh, the gender. Yeah. And yeah. they, we found out my son had a pretty major uh, congenital heart defect and mm. would require uh, a open heart surgery when he was born. And that at the time I was really, really good in my job. I was, I was, I was doing well, I was making a very, very good six figure income, you know, uh, several hundred thousand dollars a year at the time. And when, when we had our son, and he was six days old and he had to have open heart surgery. The lights went out inside. And it was just mm. like to do really good in a career sometimes, not sometimes, but if you want to be really, really awesome in a sales career, especially, um, you've got to be sharp like all the time. There's no like B game. Like yeah, you lose. You don't show up. You don't make money. Yes. And I would just, we lived in the hospital for a while. Then I, I went to... After we got out, and by the way, he's okay now. Um, for all of you listening, just so you know, the end yeah, of the yeah. program, he's great, he's wild, he's a little naughty. Um, I would go to do my work and I would do my thing and I would just, I would struggle. I wasn't there mentally and emotionally. Mm. And I just, I couldn't take my job anymore. I hated mm. my job. The, everything about it is like you go to work and you just like, you don't like your boss or coworkers and all the, the things, right? You just grit your teeth, walking oh, in, just oh, grit your teeth. Yeah, I just, it was miserable. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure people have been there. Maybe you're there right now listening. But Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about at all. Not at this job. Just to clarify, this past jobs, I've been well, there. You know what, Trevor, I, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, but I would go to, I would go to my work. And then I had listened. My sanity would come. I would, at my church, I would, we had a lot of land at the church. And I would mow 15 acres a week mm. uh, on this big mower. And I would, it was my place of just quietness and I would go mow and I listened to Rich Dad Poor Dad during this time. And I finished the book while I'm mowing grass and I remember stopping the mower and I'm like, I, I had the thought, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to do this. I'm quitting my job. And, you know, I was, I was making good enough money now, but we were in time, I was uninsured uh, when we had Oh self. yeah. So I don't know if anybody's ever been through some kind of major medical disaster like this, but we were a million dollars in debt, medical bill debt. We had to go at the time and get on Medicaid and Medicare uh, for, it was just a hot mess, man. And so there's so many things happening during that season. I'm crying as I'm going to work every day. It was just, and Jeez. I, I had this thought, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to be a real estate investor. <laughs> and I'm I, thinking back through this now, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're insane. Yeah. And also a job with no insurance. <laughs> <laughs> also a job with no insurance. And yeah. so I had this thought. And so all I did was I called, I picked up my phone and I called my friend. He's the only guy I knew who was uh, ever done like this flipping houses kind of a thing, you know, which in yeah. turn it was wholesaling houses. And he had done one deal. It was a bigger deal. And he made like a couple hundred grand. And that was it. And I called him like, Hey, uh, didn't you do this thing with real estate? I think I'm going to quit my job. And he was like, what? And he was like, yeah, there's a podcast. Listen to this podcast. That's what it is. And he told me the name of a, of a different podcast, which I won't name, but it was just a, a podcast about wholesaling houses kind of a thing. Yeah. I listened to it. I binged it. I even listened to, I think some carrot stuff, you know, you know, as it, just things, things weren't as accessible back in the day you know, yeah. as they are now. So a lot less information nine years ago. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's no YouTube, nothing, you know, yeah. not like that. No YouTubers. Um, so anyway, I go and I, I binge this man and I'm like, if that guy can do it, 
that girl can do it. I can certainly do this. Not in a prideful way, but in a way of like, you know, they're like me, like a normal person. And so I started kind of going down this road emotionally. I'd be going to work every day. I was a little excited about maybe there's a possibility I could get out of this job I hate. Yeah. Well, one day I, I had the guts and I took my wife to this nice steakhouse. And I hadn't told my wife I was doing all this, right? So I, I go into this nice steakhouse and I'm sort of sitting in this booth and I tell my wife, like, we just get, you know, just getting stability inside of our, of our life. Again, our son is mm-hmm. kind of, he's okay. Uh, I'm still messed up in the head, but he's okay in living. We go on this date and I tell my wife, we're sitting there eating. And I'm like, wow, you know, hey, babe, um, I think I'm going to quit my job. <laughs> what? Tact, tact. <laughs> what are you doing? And she's like, she talks me off the ledge of like, you're not just going to quit because yeah. that was my personality. I'm, I'm in, man. I'm, I feel I'm, you, man. I feel I'm you. A committed individual. And so I go and she talks me off the ledge and she's like, okay, if you really think this is the thing, uh, then I'll, I, you know, I, I believe in you. I, but here's what I ask. I ask that you just, you don't quit. So you, I want you to do it on the nights and weekends kind of thing. So yeah. I go out and I put my first bandit sign out. I did bandit signs like night at bandit. Like after I would go off my day job, I would come home. I'd get some bandit signs. I'd save up my money and get bandit signs. I'd put them out like a bandit at nighttime, you know, like in our area. And I got this call from my, this guy, his name is Lewis. Um, I won't mention his last name. I'll never forget called me up and wanted to sell this house. And I go over there and the thing that we met with, I never really met a seller before. Um, I actually did meet one seller prior to that, but the police got called on me and it was just insane, like an insane story. But this is the first real seller. That's the story for another day. Yeah. But this is the first real seller that was really motivated and all this stuff. And I'm sitting there and it's just like my insurance job. It was just the same. It's just different paperwork. And he's sitting there telling his story. And he was like, I was back at my job again. And I was good at it right there because it was about the people. And so he talked to me and we figured out the price and I got this deal. And I, but I did, had no idea what to do. So I went to a local RIA meeting. I found this out. I went to a RIA meeting and sold with this guy. And I made seven grand my very first deal. Mm-hmm. And my wife told me I could quit my job after I made money. And so I nice. called the CEO of the company who I was working with at the time and um, some other people. And I was like, Hey, adios. I'm out. That's fast. One deal, one deal. You're like, I can do this. And the seven grand was like a million dollars to me. You know, it was just like, it wasn't the most money in the world, but it was proof of concept. Like this works. Well, especially nine years ago. We're a different story. Oh my gosh, man. It was just (laughs) so much money. It changed my life forever. And it made me believe like I could do it. And I never, looked back. I never sold another insurance policy. Uh, I, I just kept going. I kept doing it over and over and over again. And, and then pretty soon, uh, here we are. We're, we're here. And I, some days I just can't believe it. When that, when you got that $7,000 check and the light bulb went on, you're like, okay, boom, proof of concept. Were, did you feel like some sort of gratitude or like, man, I'm so glad I did this crappy insurance thing, like this job that I'm gritting my teeth about, you're like, okay, it's all the same thing, but just different paperwork. Yeah. Now that's a great question. And I think the way I view it now is I would never be here right now. No one would ever know my name Mm -hmm. in the real estate space. If I had never done that job, I owe so much to that job, that company, that training, the people who set me up for success because they taught me tenacity. They taught me how to be tough. They taught me how to, to do the hard thing, like going out every day. And they were, they were really good at training people how to do the thing. And it really set me up. You know, they, yeah. they say everyone who's successful stands on somebody else's shoulders. And that is 100% true for me. It mm-hmm. really taught me how to work a daily schedule and go out and, and hustle and do the thing, right? Yeah. And get rejected and, and get over comfortable. And over again, like to yeah. your face, like door knocking. No, I, I don't want it. You know, I don't want insurance. It's a, it's a one call close. You go there and you, it's a hard close. You're like you have to sell something to somebody that they have to pay for their entire life and they have to die to use. Yeah. It's a really challenging sale. And you have to get in their house. Basically, they have no idea who you are. You have to basically get in the home and you have to get their bank account and social security number. Like right yeah. then. Hey, how you doing, Brady? Let me in your house. Give me your bank account, social security number. And you got to pay for this, by the way, for the rest of your life. And yeah. you got to use it. 
So it's a big, it's a big sales pitch. Yeah. And I do that every day. And I train people. I actually became pretty good at that and trained tons and tons of agents how to do it and was successful during that season. But that's awesome, man. Well, pr- props to you. The funny tidbit, I can't remember if I told you this before. I actually had my insurance license for a short stint. I worked for Farmers Commercial and then I ended up working for an agent. Um, got my insurance license, property casualty, life and health. Never sold a single policy. Single policy. My, my path went the opposite of you. I was like, I hate this. I'm not going to grit my way through it. Got out of it. But I never learned how to deal with a rejection. So then I bought a book called Rejection Proof. Pretty good book. But anyways, I commend you because I saw that path that you were on. And I was like, nope, not for me. <laughs> it's tough. Money in it. It was, it was solid money in the deal. And I, it taught me how to be resilient because you get yeah. so many no's, right? Like no one wants to talk about dying. But yeah, yeah, yeah that's how I got into business is door to door sales. And I learned so much about people. And that is actually hmm. what made me, I think it made me. Uh, pretty good at real estate because I learned a lot about people in their lives. Yeah. You understood not only the psychology of how they tick, but what's, what's functioning in their lives. Cause that, that line of work, you really have to understand what's going on in their lives in insurance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about maybe team first. Talk about, um, you're kind of solo. Um, yeah. what's the journey with team look like for you over the years? Have you always been okay with being kind of solo or have there been times when you tried to scale? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. So like, you know, as I'll put it this way, as the wholesaling business kind of took off, you know, and when I say the business, I mean like the industry as a, as a whole, like in popularity, uh, it became much more popular to have a huge team, right? Like, get your, get your big team in place and go hire acquisitions people and dispositions people and do all of these different things and to grow. And, and that is, there's a lot of truth to that. If, if someone wants to do that in their own business. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I have had people who've called for me. I've had people who've done dispositions. I've had people who've done acquisitions. I've had kind of every little thing, you know, I've had VAs and cold callers and all of the stuff. Um, but kind of how it's boiled down to now is, uh, and what's worked well for me is that, you know, I've, I've just figured out how to compartmentalize the business and like what each part of the business needs, what it, what you're really required to do for each part. I understand each step, who's responsible for each thing and what those steps are and how that really integrates with the sales process. And when you're talking to a seller, uh, you know, really setting proper expectations, it eases a lot of stress from us as home buyers. And mm. there's a lot of things that can be done easier, I should say, not versus hey, I need all these different people to manage the stuff. So I yeah. right now I have I have great attorneys and they are the core, the backbone of what we do. I have attorneys, I have a couple of different attorneys where I I have their cell phone numbers. I can walk into their office anytime I want to. I can talk to them. I was talking to an attorney last night, eleven o'clock at night, sending a text message. <laughs> They're back and forth with each other and they are responsive. Yeah but they're the core of what I understand about law, like real estate law, legality of what we do and deal flow. And then you have your relationship with your paralegals at the office and all these different people who push deals along. They are the core of getting deals done in a timely manner. So I realized quickly that if you have those people in place, they really push a lot of things along uh, and they'll communicate with you as long as you have proper expectations with them and they understand how your business works. So that's a humongous portion of my business is making sure that when I hand it off to them, it's done. So I have acquisition, which is sitting in front of a seller, getting a signature. Then that goes, take a paper contract or whatever you're going to take mm-hmm. or an email one, send it to your title company or your attorneys. We deal with attorneys and send it over to them. And then that is just chilling out, right? There's nothing else I'm doing with that in the meantime, right? And now I kind of understand now we're the buyer, right? We are the actual buyer of this, of our deals. We close on nine out of 10 deals. And when I say close on, I mean assignment versus actually closing on deals. Yeah. And so then they just, my attorneys, because that they know what, what's up, they, hey, title's done. When do you want to close? And then that's a simple email. I don't need a VA or some person I'm paying for that. I can sit there and just type, type it back. It's super simple. And yeah. building a system that you can work within that works for your life. 
not somebody, not some other thing that some other person has yeah. said that you should do. Uh, it's not a complicated structure. You, you've invested, you've heavily invested over those in those relationships with attorneys over the years, and partly the volume has allowed you to do that to have that yes. that relationship. Yes, with because them. I brought them tons of business. Yeah, and they realized I was serious, and um, yeah, the, the relationship has evolved over the years, and uh, just have some pretty great friends who've really helped me along the way. So attorney's the backbone. You're the acquisitions guy. You, mm -hmm. Your sales is pretty much in your blood almost. Um, who's doing it? You're, you're doing the disposition or you got... Well, since we're the buyers, we don't really need to do disposition, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Because we're when we're vetting deals, right? We, we're yeah. vetting the deal to see how this deal is going to flow. Like how it's going to work out. What are we going to do? How are we making money on this deal? Mm -hmm. And from there, we it, the deal will kind of tell us what it's going to do. You know, yeah. in the sense of... Uh, you know, I, I look at the deals, right? I'm, I'm looking at a house. I understand my city. I understand my market really well. And that is something that we do differently than a lot of people too. Is like we go to houses, we look at places, we are meeting with sellers face to face. We don't run a virtual model. We run an in-person model of we're in our city and our local market, dominating our local market is, is our goal. And so going there and meeting people and we look at the deal and say, what are we going to do with this deal? How could we make the most amount of money in 30 days or less? Hmm. Yeah. We'll look at the deal through that lens is sometimes the answer, if we check off all the boxes, sometimes the answer is just wholesale it because maybe it's mm -hmm. not a good exit on a flip or a hotel or uh, it, it's too much stuff and we got to clean it out or there's, there's a lot of things and there's so many different variables right in this business on how to maximize profit. And so we look at each one and we will figure out what's the best path to take. Sometimes it's a, it's a wholesale, like a traditional wholesale where you assign. Other times it's you buy it, close it, clean it out. Maybe you paint it. Maybe you do like a mini flip in a hotel. Or sometimes you just clean it out and list it on the market. Or sometimes you just close it to get the seller out of the way. Uh, or you close it to deal with uh, squatters, you know, or people yeah. like that. I can't tell you all the different scenarios, but there's a ton. And that's, yeah. we just ask like, I look at the houses and I'm kind of like, hmm, what am I going to do with this house? And I figure out how to make the most money. And pretty soon you figure that out. That's that's kind of how we do it. And then I have my, the agents are the other, the last part of our business is real estate agents. They are a humongous part of what we do because mm -hmm. they help us. They're experts. They, they know how to comp properties. You know, when they're really good, they know how to comp properties. They know how to sell properties. They're, they're really great. When you find a great agent, stick with them and make them a part of your team and they will be your best friend because you don't have to run comps like they do. Yeah. Are they a referral source for you or just on the, just on the back end after you get the lead? Oh no, they're a great referral source. They're a yeah. great referral source. You know, you give an agent a couple listings a month, you know, and they're going to be asking their friends for deals. Yeah. You know, real estate agents are the very best. I mean, it's probably one of the best lead sources ever. Like, yeah. They, who are you going to call? Most people, 95% of people are going to call an agent if they have a house to sell. Yeah. This is a hoarder house or, or a traditional listing. It doesn't really matter. But if the, if the agent doesn't know your name, it's hard for them to give you a deal. So anybody listening that you're just letting retail leads just sit in your carrot account and not do anything with them, turn them over to agents and start to build a relationship with agents. That's I huge. tell you what, man, it is, it's an awesome, awesome relationship once you kind of uh, build yeah. that relationship with agents. It's, it's so important. So you're you're nine years in. You're at a point where you've got you got a few different lead sources that are working for you, and you've you've built a brand in your local area. And so you got people bringing deals your way. Give me just like a snapshot overview of your journey of trying to get leads over the years. Maybe a little bit about your journey with Carrot. And I want to hear the bad stuff too. Like when was when was Carrot not working for you? SEO and I guess like what's changed in the early days versus what you're doing for lead gen now? Yeah. So when I first started, like I said, I was doing bandit signs. So I would go out at nighttime and I put my bandit signs out and we would yeah. do that. And I did that over and over and I did that for a while, you know? So like right out the gate, I'm out there, bam, putting bandit signs out like every single night. Did you, I'm just curious, this is a distraction, but do you have to jump when you get the telephone pole, like to staple it so people can't pull it down? Yeah. Or you get a letter? Okay. So <laughs> you can build these things. It's, uh, it's called a staple hammer. And you can get a PVC pipe and you put it like, you know, like a, a staple gun, like a construction yeah. staple gun that uses like a hammer, right? Uh -huh. And so you get like a, I think it's like an inch and a half, inch and a quarter PVC pipe, just big enough to stick over the end of the yeah. staple over hammer, it. right? And you have a massive leverage, like, you know, four foot piece or something, eight foot piece, whatever. Yeah. And you can sit there and 
bam, and tack that sucker up there <laughs> and staple that thing up there. And it is not coming down. That's and, great. You know, that's, the, that's the, they even make those suckers. They make them, people sell them. They used to, but yeah. I would just go to Home Depot and made my own. So just, maybe we'll start selling carrot branded ones. That's not right. quite on brand for us, but maybe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, Anyways, <laughs> sorry, I distracted you. But no, I, I, had I did that for a while. And I went from my first deal, seventh grand, and then within about 60 to 90 days, I was really consistent about that. And I understand like, you know, how, how the bandit sign business worked and I would go put them out and we got bandit sign warts with people. I mean, with other people doing them at the time. And then I quickly went from seven grand to, I think I was making 30, 40 grand a month, you know, pretty quickly. Yeah. And, you know, with that said, you know, this is a while back and there's, there wasn't a ton of competition. So, but bandit sign people, I will say this, bandit sign sellers, someone who's willing to stop on the side of the road, look at a bandit sign and say, you know what? I think I'm going to call that number. Like mm-hmm. I've never had that thought about a sign I saw on the side of the road. But my point is that you can't mess up a motivated seller. Like if someone yeah. wants to sell their house, I don't care if it's 2015 or 2020, uh, 2024, it doesn't matter. Motivated sellers are motivated sellers. So don't judge a marketing method. So I did, mm. did that and I quickly moved into cold calling. This is when Brent Daniels was um, kind of a member of like the wholesaling Inc. stuff. It was yeah. uh, when that was kind of first starting out and Brent uh, was just, everyday guy, right? He wasn't a coach. He was just a guy. And Brent and I talked on the phone and he was like, dude, I'm crushing it with cold calling. And he ran through his script with me right there on the phone. And I'm like, okay, I got this. So I started getting the, he showed me how to set it up. We did like quick zoom, like in 10 minutes and I did the thing and I started calling. Man, that took my business quickly to do tons and tons of deals because there was no rules. There was no, it wasn't like it was now. It, it was just, it was so simple. Yeah. And, and well, and you had the, you had the sales skills. You weren't just like shoving money to a call center to make cold calls. You're like, you're, I'm doing you're it. Dialing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And did that. And I actually hired one of my buddies to come in and do that with me. So we really uh, went to town on that for a while. Um, things pivoted and changed and we did some um, um, voicemail drops and, uh, those kinds of things that were uh, very short, but effective fat, I will say. And, uh, we did that and it, that was insane. You know, they did ringless voicemails and press one transfers and like all these types of things that were, um, they were really effective. And we did tons of deals during this time, uh, mm-hmm. because there were new things and there was no regulations at all. There was just, and for some of the, like, if there's OG people listening to this, they'll, they'll laugh because there's so many things that were really, really good. Yeah. But we did, we did a lot of those things. And over the time, during this time, I, I was using Carrot. I was, I, but I used Carrot for a different reason. I wanted to find buyers uh, at, at the beginning. And I set up my site. Uh, I had a couple of different brands at the time. I was just kind of dabbling in, in those kind of things. Uh, but I had my site, I set it up and I didn't really work on it at all. I just would like set it up there. Probably like a lot of people listening, you know, they just set it up and set it and forget it. And yep. <laughs> that was my motto is to set it and forget it. And yeah. we did that for a while. And, but I worked on my buyer site and I was getting a lot of buyer leads and uh, it, that worked for me. And then one thing I knew about sales is that in, in any sales business, you're, there's a lifespan of the hustle muscle, so to speak. Yeah. And sometimes in insurance, we would say like, if you're really, really good, if you're good in sales, and you're a shark, right? You're really, really good. You would maybe last a year in door-to-door sales. Like I would have to hire 10 people to keep one person a year because it's just that hard of a business. Yeah. Because it's rejection every day. Yeah. And we would go and I'd hire 10 people. And then the best of the best, the goats would maybe stay like two to three years because it's just beat down city, right? It's just hard. And I learned something is that I was running out of steam in the business of like, uh, it was working. I was making money in the the wholesale business, but I was, I realized like I have to make a change Mm -hmm. because I don't know if I want to be the one calling all the time. I don't know if I want to deal with, if it's, to be, it's up to me mentality. I'm going to go out there and I've got to be the one calling. I've got to be the one doing the thing. And yeah. that was tough. And so I started pivoting, you know, several years ago when I decided to 
okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this thing, right? I'm gonna go in on the the online thing. But at the time, I really didn't understand. I didn't understand like the power of it. I knew it. I knew that it was a real thing, but I wasn't really like I'm all in. I thought yeah. I was all in, but I really wasn't all in. Mm. But in my mind, I was. I, I thought I was all in on the brand, but I, I wasn't really. But I had my sights and I was doing the thing and I wasn't really optimizing. I didn't understand and I just didn't take the time I should to do that. Yeah. Because I was wearing too many hats in my business. I was doing too many things. I wasn't managing my time well. And, yeah. you know, that uh, that's kind of like the, the the short version of like, I know that was not even that short, but. No, you're good. So you were grinding away on cold calls. You were like, this is not, this is not sustainable. This is not the type of business that I want to run. You're like something's got to change. It's interesting. You said like, you got the carousel, you were using it for buyers. You said it and forget it. And you thought you were doing it. I think that's important because a lot of people will like launch a website, maybe tweak it a little bit and they'll think that's the end. And a lot of people, uh, it, like they don't, they don't, do the minimum like you need to get your local photos your bio your testimonials on there it's like critical like get your testimonials on the website so that's like to me phase one even people i know who are really good in the business yeah they, i'm gonna say this nice they suck yeah at doing that they really do on just on yeah. the the brand building side, even if you're doing lots of deals, I have so many friends. And if you're my friend and you're listening to this right now in Louisville, Kentucky, you probably need to step it up, buddy boy. I yeah. have so many good friends and I get onto them all the time because I'm like, <laughs> we have no pictures of you with sellers. You have no pictures of like the brand building stuff where it's like, I'm right. actually in this business. Mm -hmm. It's just like this motto of like, I'm going to stay at home and virtually do this business has really kept people from optimizing their sites to the best thing. Like they're not, it doesn't seem like they're present. It doesn't seem like they're yeah. local. Right. And I wanted to change that. I wanted to do that. So uh, tell me about why, why'd you go all in on brand? And then, and then we'll talk about like how that played out on the carrot site. Cause I feel like we talk about carrot and SEO and the tactics, but what's more important is that decision of like, okay, I'm, I'm committed to this. I'm doing this for reals. Tell me about that decision. Well, I didn't really have a plan B. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of all in the in the real estate space. You know, I I didn't really have another. You know, I got good at the real estate stuff, so I didn't really like. Okay, what am I doing if I'm get tired? Right. Yeah, that's a real thought. Like a lot of people are probably listening to this is like, right. There's going to come a day where you're tired of of doing the thing. You wake up and you're like, I'm done. I'm done. Kind of. I'm mm -hmm. tapping. So I need to think of like how can I automate this and like. The stuff with Trevor would talk about, you guys talk about on the podcast all the time, like evergreen marketing and yeah. building a business where people can come to you who are motivated. And that was exciting to me. You know, yeah. it's kind of like a digital bandit sign. You know, bandit sign leads were always hyper motivated. They're always yeah. hyper motivated. If someone took the time to call a stinking sign on the side of the road, you're motivated. Yeah. Like, I don't, I've never called a sign and said, I need that product or service. But uh -huh. people call. And website had that lure to me. It had that lure of like, okay, there's going to be leads waiting for me. And that was a lure for me. But I wanted to build the local brand because I wanted to solve that problem of I knew I would get tired in the future. And I would get tired of the ever-changing things, right? Mm -hmm. There's I regulation and yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, because when I first started, cold calling was unregulated. Like you, we could probably make 10,000 phone calls from our cell phone and <laughs> zero spam. Like you're, you're none. I, I bet. Oh my gosh. I had the same number forever. And I called, I can't tell you how many times I've called from my phone. And we had my number as the number, as the caller ID. Yeah. And we called <laughs> for years with yeah. my personal cell phone. That's wild, man. Wild. And so you could do all this with no spam, right? So I yeah. started seeing things, you know, dip down like in, in like the results, right? In your marketing method. And well, then I would have friends who are in the space, right? People who own different businesses. I made friends with these people and they'd be like, well, things are changing, regulations happening. Then we went to text message and that was just it. wild. You know, the what truly amazing when it first came out. Well, that quickly got slapped down, right? So that yeah. quickly meaning like in two years. Um, and so things change really quick, like the efficacy of methods, right? They, they change and you had to keep changing and pivoting. And, and I was like, okay, is this sustainable? Like, is this a business that is going to sustain a long time? And I, I would hear guys who are in the industry be like, oh man, I don't know. This is not really mm. sustainable. So if you're building a big call center model like and like you're beating, beating down doors doing that, you know, 
that's going to change. And we saw like spam stuff like, man, it's hard to keep a number for a week. Like mm-hmm. now, I mean, it's, you could probably buy a number and it's still spam. Yeah. And so the, <laughs> those things, <laughs> it's just so true. Uh, you know, you would, things change so much. And I was just like, okay, I have to protect my family. That was the thing. It's like in my mind, I'm thinking, I like what I do and I need to protect my family and give some kind of sustainability, consistency in my business to where I know that I'm going to be here a long time. Like I'm going to plant my flag here as this is where I live. And I think a lot of times, you know, we, if you just listen to a lot of like people teaching it or whatever, you know, you go virtual, go all these different places, but that's a still a model. It's like a pay to play model. And there's going to be a time where maybe it changes and pivots and it doesn't work as much as it used to. And then mm-hmm. you're going to come back home to where you live and the space is gone. You there's taken, like you didn't, yeah. you didn't own that at home. And I didn't want that for me. I wanted to say, you know what? I'm, I'm here. And that's, it was just a choice. It was a choice. If I'm being really honest, I didn't, I didn't know what I know now, which I was just ignorant. And I just wanted to stay at home and I wanted to do the thing. And I, I liked it because yeah. my, my skill set was door to door sales. So I was, I liked meeting people, but yeah. it turns out it was the best decision I made because when everybody else is going virtual, I'm planting my flag locally. And if you go to our, our websites, like it's m- me and all the sellers and like my competition, it's them and like yeah. two, right? Because they just did everything virtual, even in our own market. Like they don't go to home. Right. So so that's interesting. So you were like, okay, I got to protect my family. This isn't sustainable. You went all in on brand. I'm talking about the the website, like you thought you had it figured out, but now you realize like, oh, okay, I didn't have the online portion dialed in. What were the the things that moved the needle the most when you were working on your care site, getting your online marketing dialed in over the last few years? Like, when were those big shifts for like online leads? I think that you have to, number one, you have to differentiate yourself and figure out like you care is a template. Okay. It's a template. You have to customize this template. It is a thing that they provide to you and you have to make it your own, right? You got to put your own mm-hmm. pictures on there and all the, like what, what your, what's your service? Like, what do you do? Like how do you, yeah. what makes you different? Personalize the stuff, writing content, being consistent. You have to treat it like a job, which I did not do at the beginning. And I got on there and I started personalizing my site, building my brand out, custom the things like all my, my pictures and my brand. Now some of this is just stylistic stuff, right? It's just my own personal choices, but yeah. making it my own, making it my own thing. Like in, in building and investing in my knowledge base of what SEO is, if you're not going to hire out a third party service, or if you are like just understanding so you can know. And so I started mm. learning those things. But the first step is customizing your site. Like if there's pictures on there, you need to put new pictures on there. Yeah. Like you need, it's the basic stuff. It's like step one is you're going to go personalize it. If yeah. you are in a local business, go to your closing with the seller as much as you hate it. Like <laughs> go, if you, I don't care if you're assigning it, you know, sit there. And I, I'm saying this for a reason. It's yeah. show there, get your cell phone out, take a selfie with you and your seller. And it brings credibility to your business. Like what is the thing that you provide that some other business locally does not provide? Me, it is that I am showing what I call the body of proof. Mm. I went to all the clothes. I still go to closings and I have a body of proof on my site. And there's so many more pictures that I have not uploaded to our site, but we, our body of proof is unbeatable. It's mm. that if you want to look at houses we've purchased and me with different sellers it's it's hard to compete with a localized deeply localized entrenched in the city business model and that was mm-hmm. my first thought was i'm going all in on that is i'm going to build yeah. a brand of like we're here we're the pros and that was yeah. that's what i did which is huge because then that's amplifying like any of the other conversations you're having, all the cold calling you're doing. It's like they're checking out your website. Okay, this guy's legit. They're credible. He can close on these deals. You know, especially if you're a younger person before I didn't have a beard. And so I looked a lot younger than I was, right? Uh, now I look older maybe than I am, especially if I grow up longer than this. Yeah. But, you know, coming up against like, hey, I can drop 300 grand cash on this home when you look like you're 22. That might be a credibility issue. Yeah. You know, maybe they not say that, but they might think it. And so how do you com- yeah. combat that on the internet is by having pictures of you and sellers 
at your attorney's office or title company. It look, hey, this yeah. person's actually doing it, right? So right, not just a headshot. Her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. So th- that's super important. And everybody listening, like, I know we hammer this all the time, but we hammer this all the time because there's still people that don't do it. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I can get away without doing that. Like, let me just get the leads. People get so hyper-focused on like, let me get the leads and then I can close them. But like, if you skip over the, the testimonials, building a brand that's going to mm-hmm. last through market cycles, then you're, you're missing it. Like you gotta, you gotta do the fundamentals. You just have to. You have you have to do it. I've seen so many really good wholesale guys, so and, and girls like so many people who get in this business. They're all amped up. They make some money, and pretty soon they're they're here for a year or two. And right, that hustle muscle wears out. And by the time it wears out, they're smoked. Right, it's like running a marathon. They hit mile twenty and they're done. Mm-hmm. Like you hit yeah. that wall and you hit are smoked. And I have so many friends who have been excellent wholesalers. And when I say excellent wholesalers, I mean, these guys are making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year. But yeah. three years in, they're done dealing with all of their acquisitions people and dispositions people and they're done with the business, but they haven't built their brand. They didn't build yeah. that, the sustainable piece that allowed them to stay in business. And so when they're done mentally and emotionally in their business, or they have family crisis that comes in and they're like tapped out, it's hard to keep going. And they, I've seen countless people they're in, they're awesome. They're all doing another job because now yeah. they just can't do it anymore. And this is where this piece of sustainability and branding come into place is like, treat it like we're farmers. Like mm-hmm. we are planting seeds in like the future. You is going to thank you a million times over. If you start planting the seeds now, because the harvest is coming. It's going yeah. to be there and like invest in yourself now. So this is wildly different from where you were at when you first started investing and just like turn to burn and cold calling, wholesaling. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you, how are you thinking about your business before we, we hit record on the podcast? You're telling me about how you're like really spending some strategic time thinking about your business and the content that you put out. What does that look like? Um, like how are you spending your time thinking about the business and how does that play out in your marketing? I think a lot about what I do, you know, as, as an individual about who we serve. I think about, I, this is a people business and real estate is the byproduct of what we do. Mm-hmm. It is unequivocally, we are in the people business and we deal with people. We talk to people every day and by helping people, the real estate at a discount comes to us and it is, that is what we deal with. And I sat down and I was trying to figure out who do we serve? And I was thinking about all the different transactions that I've done and been through and a recent transaction that we had purchased and like, who is this person? Where do they fit? And I'm thinking of data points, right? Like, yeah. know, like we're just thinking of like all the different things that we bought houses at and like, what are the situations and people that, that we've dealt with? What do those people look like? What do they do for a living? All the things. And it really came down to four real main areas. It is that we deal with. We have so many things. And if you're new in this business, hopefully this really helps you a lot is because I think every person fits in this bucket. Every person fits in these four buckets. And I call this my core four. Hmm. These people that we help, all sellers that I've ever dealt with fit in one of these four categories or a combination of one or two or all of them. So number one is that people typically that we deal with, they go through financial hardships. Some kind of a financial hardship is a part of their life, maybe on the deal. Maybe it's not, but people could fit in that. People also could be fitting in, I would say, major life changes or crisis, like something like that would be a major, major life events. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, you're inheriting a property or someone is passing away or some major thing in your life, you know, marriage, divorce, things like that. You fit in that category. Another one would be like problems with the actual property, like thinking about that. And like the other one, I would say a life transition. So you would have life transition. You have a property problem. You have major life events and you have financial problems. Like, and so outside Mm -hmm. In those, those are like all the people we deal with. And every seller I've ever dealt with fits in one or all of those categories. People have 
We're dealing with people who are dying, we're dealing with people who are bankrupts, bankruptcies, who are in the financial problem, people who are, you know, going through the house has caught on fire, which is a maybe you don't fit in a financial problem plus the fire, but maybe the fire caused you to be a motivated seller. Bought yeah. a bunch of those. You know, there's just so many things like a health problem, which would be a major life event. You need to sell off rental property. So we understanding my point of that is that understanding who we serve at a core level creates us to be a brand that serves these people mm -hmm. and serve them well. So when you're creating a brand, creating branding, you want to figure out your branding is like, who, who do we serve? How do we serve these people? Are we serving people in our market that they're going through a divorce? They're going through, you know, big time things. And how do we do that? And each person can think through all this and, and kind of craft their, their message to their seller. Like me, yeah. my, my brand, I, I preach credibility with my branding. Like we're yeah. a credible local home buyer who have all yeah. the experience in the world to get this job done, no matter what you're facing. Yeah. So it's really, it's funny. It's timely that we're having this conversation because the most, the, some of the recent podcast episodes we've done been about creating a value proposition. And then just today at the time of recording this, like how to create a memorable brand. And what, what we see is investors, business owners all the time make the mistake of making it too much about themselves. What do we do? What do we offer? You know, sell your house fast, it's simple. Yeah but not enough time doing what you're doing, which is getting really deep into the mind of the different sellers, the different avatars. Yes. And a lot of times we want to make this content about us and me, 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 but you have to get into your seller's head and think, who is this person? What are they going through emotionally? How am I going to be where they are? And then your content is going to kind of revolve around that. Like maybe you're dealing with a probate situation or maybe it's, a situation that's a divorce and maybe they just inherited a property too and they're going through combo situations. There's so many things. I literally, one of the most recent houses I just bought is a home that a people were separated and during the separation of the marriage, the husband passes away. Now we have a probate situation on top of this. And then we have, we're combining multiple different issues now of, of this getting complex. Mm -hmm. And I had to sit down with the seller and walk through all of the options and all the things. And it's really understanding who that person was. And at the very end of the conversation, they were thrilled. We hugged. They felt great because they felt understood. And if, if you can understand your seller, it's going to make you a much better brand builder and a business owner. And when it comes to building that online presence persona and who you are, who you serve, why you do it. And it, yeah. it, it really matters. Take a personal approach. I would, I would say, man, I would agree with that. And I'd say that, you know, of all the time I spend around uh, other marketers, other business owners, other investors, I think one of the biggest common threads, if not the biggest is um, around those who are really successful is that they understand how to get in the head of their prospects. It sounds kind of weird, but like they know how to really just pause and get in the shoes of what they're thinking. Like what are their exact problems? What are their fears, pain points, desires? And how are they actually saying it? And how can I speak directly to them? How can I empathize with them? How can I speak specifically specifically to their problems? And we're yeah. talking about this because it all it all plays out in your marketing. Like what yeah. you're talking about, like your brand, that's that's your messaging. This is what the copy on the website should be talking about. So I, it's I not just always think about price. It's not always about yeah. the money. It's it uh, most times it's not. I mean, yeah, it's really solving some of these bigger problems of you know of what we deal with in life. And I think if on being an understanding person and sending that message in your own personal yeah. way is really, really important to building your own unique brand that lasts a long time. Yeah. It is too often overlooked, man. Um, well, I want to kind of, I want to kind of start to wrap it up here. One, one of the things I wanted to talk about and kind of fulfill on the title of this episode is what are you, what are you doing to stand out and sustain as competition gets worse and as the industry, um, as the housing market gets, gets a little bit more squeezed? That's a great question because man, just over the last couple of years, things have changed. I mean, drastically, right? Yeah. Uh, just on the, just on the internet space, right? Just on the website, mm -hmm. the website, 
side of things. People have really come in, like bigger companies are, are coming into the spaces. And for me, pivoting to more of an online, you know, like I've been online, but like really pivoting online, really preaching that credibility, pre preaching that. And when I say credibility, I mean, really broadening our scope of what we do, who we serve and really trying to encompass mm -hmm. a lot of what I would call online, a, a visibility, like making sure that yeah. we are visible because if people cannot find you, you're not going to get deals. And so are you to, when you say that, are you talking about like SEO for like different keywords on your website? Or are you talking about different marketing channels altogether, like different platforms? I would say both. Mm -hmm. I, I would say both. I would say making sure, number one, get your website unlocked. Make sure that, that you are visible to search terms. Deep yeah. dive the SEO world and understanding specifically on-page content. Like on page, if you're trying to just build a million profile backlink and you're trying to just get like mega backlinks and your on-page stuff sucks, you will lose, I think, every day of the week yeah. uh, to guys who have awesome on-page stuff. So focus on on-page stuff first. Like get get your content where it's good. Like make that yeah. where it, it stands out. I think through, you know, we're not going to go down this road, but like through some of the Google stuff that's recently come out and like mm -hmm. stuff that's really pertinent right now, uh, on-page is king. Uh, it really – and. I think it's got to be helpful. It's got to be real, especially in the age of AI. It's got to be real, helpful, valuable content. It really has to answer questions. It has to be a real answer to questions. Yeah. How do I sell my house fast in X city? And you need to answer that question as best possible and then be visible for that answer across multiple places. And then YouTube, Facebook, X. I mean, all of the things where you're – content could live, make sure you're there. Because if when people are looking, you're not found, somebody with bigger pockets, somebody with, you know, I should say deeper pockets, are they're coming in, you know, venture capital, they're, they're coming into the space yeah. and they want real estate. Uh, and this is the place where they're going to live, I think, for, for a long time is the online place and just being visible, really good content that is very valuable to a person and find out like, I want to be the probate king or queen in my city. I want to be the person who helps people through divorce. I want to be the person who helps deal with bad tenants in my area. I am the person who can help, you know, yeah. do this thing. And I'm the expert in this area and then go online and write good content about it. Like actually go and write. Luckily, the tools are better than ever right now. And everybody can access those things and learn how to do it in a good way where it is uh, really, really valuable content. You can do it. Yeah, for free. I think I would agree with that, man. And I I think uh, the saying "the niches is in the riches" is like the theme at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Like you said, there's been more competition. There's been more people learning SEO, but a lot of people get hung up on like just the sell my house fast in certain city. Like, there's so many different niches, so many different areas you can go after, and now's the time to start going after those. It is. There's, there's a lot of search volume. There's a lot of things going on online and, and you don't have to be like, oh, my competition is, is massive. It's, if you start now, you will be thankful in, in a little bit of time. You'll be thankful and just build that brand, build this sustainability and, and go yeah. do this along with other marketing channels. And it's going to be, you'll be, you'll be really thankful over time because there's so many things. I mean, I have, I know guys who have huge backlink profiles that their content is just meh. Uh, as kids might say, mid. And is it, that the thing now? Is that a term? Mid? Oh, heck yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. bro. No cap. That's what they say. No and, cap. Okay. I got to yeah, stay up on right, this. No cap. <laughs> that's the thing. So, um, but it's the content is just that's average, you know? And so they have a huge, they spend all this money in backlinks, but then they, they don't have good uh, content. So, like, really yeah. do the thing that you can control uh, right off the bat if you're trying to get in and just build that brand where it's, you know, really focus and be credible and, and build a localized brand because. Someday when those leads are coming in, it's going to be very, you never, you never know what, what's going to pop in your email. Yeah. Could be that's awesome, awesome, man. Well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I really love how you've just doubled down on building a brand. Um, in the podcast we recorded earlier today, Trevor was describing it as a moat around your business. And like, you can see that with the brand you built on Simply Sold. It's a moat. It's providing stability and some consistency to your business. And uh, it's, it's a, it's quality leads. It's not like hustling on cold calls. <laughs> come on, you know, come on. It's, it's not thinking like, where is this business going? Like spend time. Yeah. Everybody who's, you know, if you're listening and you want to do this for a living, think, you know, where's this industry going? You know, build, 
friends yeah. who are in this space, like, where are we going over the next three to five years? Like, what does that look like? You know, yeah. in that, and then think, how can I be sustainable and build a, a brand and a business that is here, you know, for a long time, like building something that is worth something. And it's all online, I think. Let's, let's wrap it up there. I want, that's, that's the final thing I wanted to ask you. And I, I forgot until you said that what's on your mind over the next three to five years, like what's coming down the pipeline? What are you paying attention to? You know, I, I've over the last couple of years, you know, four years, I've worked with um, a lot of venture capital, a lot of um, specific, specifically on the hedge fund side of things. I've spent a lot of time talking to those kind of guys and sold a lot of properties to, you know, hedge funds and different things like that. And I, I've seen the pivot and, and the transition of where homes are going and how the market is played out. Like kind of like a big picture. I, I tried to pay attention, like where are the wealthiest people in the world spending their money? And consistently, mm -hmm. it seems like they are investing in real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also investing in land, which is a whole, I've seen a lot of hedge funds, they've moved to land and, and just take that for what it's worth for all of you land guys. I know land, I know land hedge funds right now. They're all in on land. And I, I recently got a call by a major hedge fund. They are investing a hundred million dollars in pre-development work in, in, in homes. America is behind the times in yeah. construction. We don't have enough homes. And I spent mm -hmm. really in the Midwest and in the South, Southwest or Southeast part of our corp country is we need more construction, I guess all over the you know, all of the country need that, but specifically, yeah. they're investing a lot in the Midwest and in the South, Southeast. And I'm seeing a lot of opportunity. Um, they're putting tons, hundreds of millions of dollars into land, pre-land development, and they're building more homes, uh, which anytime that you have somebody come in and scooping up properties and you, know, we need houses to live in. And so single family homes are always going to be around. There's blue collar America is a great place to live. I think yeah. that it's a great place to build your business around your brand around and there's sustainability within that, which I love that. And I think the online space is going to get busier and busier because uh, they got to put, they got to feed the beast, right? They have money to place. I, yeah. I had a call yesterday. These guys, they said, we need to place $10 million immediately into homes and we need to do it. And the market has changed so much. They, they've got to go get these houses somehow. So there's a lot of yeah. opportunity. I'm, I'm saying all that to say this is that in the single family space and maybe in the land investing space for some of you land investors who are, have your carrot sites out there, you know, double down, make sure you're there, make sure you're visible when people are searching, make sure that you have this opportunity of like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to plant the field. I'm going to go all in on this and I'm going to, I'm going to be either all in on single family or I'm going to do land as well. And I know guys who do both well, but double down, be, be present, be ready to, as things pivot and change, be adaptable because change is inevitable. And as things change, as the market changes, as, as regulations change, be, be on the cutting edge, be there, be knowing what's happening and build that brand. It's, it's someday when you don't want to do this anymore, um, having leads pop in is, is, is always a nice day when you kind of don't want to get out of bed. Yeah. It's an asset. <laughs> nice, man. I'm not even going to recap it. I'm just going to leave it away. You said, um, thanks for sharing the insight. That's really interesting with what's coming down the pipeline over the next three to five years, but I agree with that. Um, thanks for sharing, man. This has been a really valuable conversation. It's been fun. I know we've had you on the podcast before. If anybody yeah, listening, well we've done a couple episodes. We did a really good one on, uh, all about testimonials with you and Keith. That was a good one. It's yep, been a it fun number of times. I know it won't be the last time, but thanks for sharing with everyone. Where can people find you? Do you want people to find you? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I live my life, um, probably different than a lot of people. I, if yeah. you follow me on Instagram, you know, it's just my name, Bo Hollis, but I, 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 I don't really, I'm not going to tell you how to find the next deal. Probably. I, I was that guy for a while. I, I just, I don't know if I care enough to, about yeah. that kind of thing. I want to provide content. I want to provide value, but I, I'm a dad, I'm a husband. And I, I just, yeah. I, I, I'm there and I, I like doing stuff like that. You can find my website simply sold, but if you want to follow me on a personal side of things, it's on my, my Instagram account and we just I might post pictures of my kids or what we're doing fun or things I'm thinking about. So that's, that's kind yeah. of what we're doing. But for all of you listening, you know, just stay focused and don't get shiny objects and, go do yeah. other things like pass up the good and, and go for the, the thing that is worth building. 
Nice, man. That's good. I can cheers to that. I'll put links in the in the comments or in the show notes in the description, website, and social, whatever. Um, but I can cheers to that, knowing what's important. Family, dad, husband first. Awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, it's been good having you on. Thanks, Boa. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you got value out of this, share with a friend. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. I would love for you to do that. If you like this episode, uh, share it up. Uh, shoot me an email, brady at care.com, if you have any thoughts or if you know someone who's a good fit for the podcast. If you got a story like Bo's, let me know. I'd love to chat. But thanks for listening. We'll see you all later. <laughs>